Welcome to another episode of Spotlight on Business. Today we're going to be talking with the certified arborist, Scott Swain, about what it takes to do government contracting. So stay tuned. to another episode of Spotlight on Business. Today, we're gonna to be talking about government contracting and what it entails. Uh, we're gonna be speaking with Scott Swain. Scott Swain is a certified arborist who owns TCS Forestry Management. Scott, it's always a pleasure talking with you. It's my pleasure being here. You, you know, we, we have had a uh, working relationship for what, 15, 16 years? Something like that when I come to your first meeting in Gallup Police. Uh, and that's with the uh, Small Business Development Center. Uh, and it's, it's interesting, through the course of, of time, uh, you have been a very actively involved in a variety of different business directions, uh, and it all surrounds your being an arborist. For the most part, yes. I, uh, I at one time worked for one of the largest uh, consulting companies in the country. Uh, come home, started the business, a residential tree service. Uh, we got into doing some work with uh, the state of Ohio. Uh, we then moved to federal contracting and uh, that's pretty much all we do now is state and federal contracting on the removal of trees. Now when you say you're a certified arborist, what does that mean? That's the International Society of Arboriculture and it is a course and a training that you have to go through and testing to prove your knowledge and skills and that is the standard by which the government uses to see if you know enough to work for them. So, so if I acquire a tree service, let, let's just suppose I wanted to prune my tree, and I, I do like many individuals, I get on the, in the phone mm -hmm. book, or I look up on the internet, uh, and I see John Smith. Yes. Tree service. Uh, is he also a certified arborist? They, they can be and not advertise, but most people that do have it, advertise it. Uh, they will have a, uh, an ISA certified ISA. CA number there that will show the state or, or chapter of the firm. Uh, not only do you want to get a certified arborist, you want to make sure you get someone that has insurance. Uh, insurance, oh, that's a good, good point. Um, and, and really, uh, to me, you know, since I'm not involved with, with trees except to look at them or, or uh, uh, trim them, etc., cetera, um, pruning a, a tree is easy, isn't it? Yes. Pruning it correctly is not. Okay. The, it, it, that's the idea behind the training and the, the certification is to know what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do it, and uh, the best ways to treat a tree to reduce either the height, uh, the width, uh, the canopy, or just take dead limbs out of it, uh, make it healthier, whatever. There, you will see guys out there that will just literally top a tree. You'll see the stumps and everything left on top, top of the tree. All you're doing there is killing your tree and it will have to hire somebody to come and cut it down. It shouldn't look like a bean pole when they get done. Now, I, I noticed that uh, some of my neighbors would top, mm -hmm. and then uh, they, they indicated that uh, it would maintain a smaller growth and mm. it would stay the same size. No, that's not, that's not a correct. There's easier ways to do that, uh, to maintain the size of a tree that doesn't harm it as much. So hire somebody that, that's actually been trained, hire somebody that actually knows what they're doing, and hire somebody that is worried about your tree being there in the future and not just the job today. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So how did you, how did you first start uh, the, the direction you wanted to go and that was working with trees? I needed a job. 
Yeah, it, it's pretty much as simple as that. I started working with a utility. Uh, they started the tree crew company. I started working with that. I liked it. Uh, then I started getting training, and the more training I got, the more training I wanted, and you know, voila. One, one thing led to another. And here I am. <laughs> and and um, since, since you have been very actively involved in the tree services, etc., cetera, uh, your next direction was uh, starting your own business. It was easy, wasn't it? It was exceptionally easy, with the exceptions of borrowing the money, buying the equipment, hiring the people, and finding the jobs. <laughs> Other than that, it was really easy. <laughs> Um, and so that's one of the reasons why you took advantage of a variety of different programs. You know, one was... We did. We took, we took advantage of a lot of the programs that, that you were involved in that come out of the Endeavor Center here, that uh, come out of Rio Grande and come out of OSU, that help individuals starting a business or, or starting out trying to figure out what they want to do and how they want to do it and you know the the help was it in just wisdom was the help in business plan was the help in financial what what uh, it okay most of it in the very very beginning was giving us a direction on how to go and where to go to find the information we needed to work with and for the government uh, the second part was the training we needed to be able to work with and for the government. It, it's not just uh, go out there and, and I want to work for the government and you start working for the government. You, we have, uh, you have to be SAM registered, which SAM.gov, you can go on there and register your company. Uh, we have to be, our company has to have AT1 training, that's terrorist training. We have to have a SPRS scorecard, uh, you, the workers' comp, the insurance, all of these things are pieces into a puzzle to work for the government and to be able to be successful working for the government. Now, when you, when you talk about government, are we talking just federal or is it state, we, county? We, we, we don't do much county work or local municipality work. We do. Uh, work for the state of Ohio, uh, we've worked for the state of West Virginia, we're on the list to work for the state of Kentucky, uh, and we do federal agencies. We've worked for the USDA, uh, the National Park Service, the National Forest Service, uh, we work with DOD all the time, and these are the, the agencies that put out most of uh, the contracts that we are looking for. Now, it's my understanding it's the lowest bidder that gets the jobs, is that correct? Not all the time, no. The government does, and even the state of Ohio to some degree, does a, what is called best, best value. So it, it's not just the lowest price because of the, on some contracts, the proposal you put in, your past performance that you have uh, that shows you have done this type of work before count as much as the price. So it's a three three pronged approach that the government uses is price, uh, the proposal which is your work plan, how you plan to do the job and spelling it out step by step and also your past performance and showing that you know what you've done and you've done it in the past before. Hmm. Uh, and I, I'm assuming that, uh, let, let's suppose I, I wanted to uh, do grass, mow grass. Mow grass. Um, so, so in essence, all I have to do is I have to contact someone at the uh, Department of uh, uh, Transportation to mow the lawn? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not uh, the way it works. The easiest way is... Uh, it is to go on SAM.gov and start looking through uh, what is called SIN numbers and that will put you down into the categories of what products you're going to, or services, products and services that you're going to offer to the government. You find your SIN numbers, uh, we do 561370. Uh, 
at that point in time, the contracts that are up for bid will show up, and you can look through them and, and decide if it is a uh, one that is in the area you want to work in? Is it the size that you want? Is it uh, the scope that you want to do? You know, there might be different things attached to it. You mentioned grass. Most grass contracts also come with snow removal. So if you don't do snow removal, huh. you know, so, so you have to look at the whole scope of the contract to see what they're wanting in the end and to see if you can produce or, or give that service to them and it matches what you want to do and what, what they want out of the project. Now, I, I've seen some of the uh, bid proposals. Uh, they can be quite uh, intense. Or, or what my uh, project man manager used to call our uh, bucket list proposal starts off with 42 pages. 42 pages. And then we add our work plan and any other details to it after that. There's a, there's a lot of things that go into working with and for the government that the government is concerned about that most people do not think about or, or, or would even enter their mind. Uh, we have to ensure we're not going to be in wetlands. We have to ensure that we're not going to uh, be any harm to endangered species. Uh, we have to use uh, certain types of fuels and things, uh, biodegradable uh, oils and things. There, there are a lot of things that the government wants that uh, if you're bidding to your neighbor's uncle down the street that he doesn't care about, but the government does care about. And that's, that's the part of the proposal that most people slip up on, is not giving the information to the government. So, so I, I'm assuming when bid solicitation comes out and you respond to that, um, and then you quote a price. Yes. Uh, and when you quote the price, uh, is there any leeway? You know, let, let's suppose you get the contract and you said forty-two thousand dollars, but then you came back and found it was forty. You should have bid forty-five thousand. Is there any leeway to? To changing the, the bid numbers? That has a lot to do with what type of contract you're on. Most of ours uh, do not. Some of them do. It's called a change order. Uh, you know, construction contracts, if they're building a road or something like that, uh, construction contracts will have change orders in them because they, they get in and literally the environment changes. Our, what we do, there's very few change orders unless literally the government changes their minds in the middle of the project. At that point in time, then we go back and do a change order to encompass what they have want changed, whether it's more trees cut down, less trees cut down, fences moved, what, whatever they're wanting done after the fact that we have the contract, then we'll do a change order and encompass that into the original order. The, the, re the reason I, I bring that up, uh, sometimes I hear individuals decide, well, I want to get the lowest bidder. And they know that you charge $45, so I'm going to do $35. Yes. And that is not wise. It, it is, you, you, whether, whether you're hiring somebody to mow your grass, trim your trees, uh, build your house or whatever. It, it's not just the price that's involved. It is the experience of the person. It is the knowledge of the person. It is uh, their background, their knowledge. Uh, do they have insurance? Do they have workers' comp? Do they have uh, the training? Do they have the expertise? Do they have the employees to do things? These are all things that uh, go into deciding who who you want to do your project. Just because the guy's lowest doesn't mean he's best. It, I see. It, you know, there's a lot of things involved in, in hiring a, a correct contractor. And what most people fail to take in into light when they're hiring somebody on even a local scale is that if you're doing a business and doing it correctly, you're paying your taxes, you're have workers' comp insurance, if you have uh, material insurance, all the, these cost money. 
and and there's a certain cost just to go out and start the truck in the morning and if he's doing it right and doing the things that need to be done he has to recover those costs might be higher but he might be better I, I, I very much understand and you know one of the things that I found is that uh, if you agree to something with the government there's no take backs so in other words if you agree to do something for $45,000 and you fail to do that what happens well, if we fail to meet the end of a contract, uh, one, they don't pay us, obviously, you know, so we've spent all the money that we spent for not, but they also put us on a no-bid list. You go on a no-bid list, it, it's literally what it sounds like. They won't take bids from you. So, yeah, even, even if, which we never have, uh, in the beginning, we got close a couple times, but we never have underbid a project where we didn't make money. Even if we did, we would still finish the project to stay off that no-bid list. Huh. That's the reason we spend so much time, so much energy, and so much expense making sure we know what each project is and knowing what every component of that project is and what the government expects out of it. So I, I would imagine then if, if you're talking about that, you have turned down doing certain bids. Yes, we turn, we turn down every day we turn down. You know, I was looking at the uh, SAM site this morning at six o'clock and uh, you know, just to run through them, you know, because there's, there, it, it's either location uh, that we didn't like uh, some of the components of the project we didn't like uh, you know th there's different reasons and different things timing comes up to it you know right now we have projects going for ODOT uh, that have to be finished by the end of the month okay at that point in time you know we're a little scrambled we don't take on a lot more projects you know during that time mainly because we just can't get to them so there's a lot of reasons to turn down a project. There's very few reasons to take one on. And to take one on means that, that you like where it's at, you like what uh, the components of the project is, and you like what, you, you think that you are going to be able to produce a good product at the end that everybody's going to be happy with. Hmm. I, I, I see. Um, so. Is there a difference between uh, the federal government and the state government? Very much. Very much? Very much, yeah. The, the way it's done and the way the bidding process is for the state, uh, especially what we do for the state. Uh, the state of Ohio has a, uh, an over what they call an umbrella contract, and you have to give them the information at that point in time. and then they call who they want to bid on each project to to do that. So, you know, the federal government doesn't do that. If you're registered with SAM and you have the ability, you can bid on any project for the federal government. And is the uh, uh, different paperwork more or less when it comes to the federal government? Oh, federal government's way more. Um, the state of Ohio, we send an invoice in uh, to the district, which, you know, wh whether it's Columbus or Delaware, uh, Chillicothe, Marietta, uh, and they send it to Columbus and run it through processing. Uh, the federal government has, at my last count, I think seven different invoicing platforms. Uh, you know, whether it's for the militaries, for the uh, individual, agencies and some agencies have their own invoicing platform uh, so just just getting your money and that's another thing if anybody's going to do federal contracting is you you're going to wait on your money they will pay you there's you know one, once they give you a contract you're guaranteed to get paid if you finish the contract but you're going to wait on your money 30 days 
So, so uh, suppose I'm, I'm doing a, a $300,000 bid uh, and I know it's going to cost me $200,000. Yes, sir. The government doesn't come along and, and pay you it's before. Court, it, it is according on what the project is and whether it's in phases or oh, okay. those sections. Okay. Uh, we do... To, we, we've done projects to where when you get one piece of it done, they, they give you a siphon or a, oh, okay. you know, let you okay. invoice for that. And we've done projects when, you know, we just finished one in February in Wisconsin that, you know, we wait, you know, we have to invoice the whole thing at one time. Uh, but you knew that going up. No, you know right. that going in. You have to have your finances. You have to make sure that your bank or your lending institution or whoever you're getting your money from knows what you're doing and knows that you're going to be waiting on this money and that as soon as you get paid you'll pay them. Most banks understand this situation. Most of them, uh, you know, even credit unions will, will work with somebody that's doing this because they know the money's there. It just takes a while to get it. So we want to be able to finance the whole project. But it's not just financing the project, it is continuing to do business after the project is done until you get your money in. So whatever your daily costs are, you're going to spend that for 30 days until you get paid by the government. So it's not just the cost of the project you got to figure in. It's the cost of what it costs you to do business until you get your money. And I, I've also heard about bonding. What do they mean by bonding? Uh, construction, uh, we don't bond. Oh, okay. Uh, we, because if we don't finish the job, it's just not done, you know. But uh, construction projects and things that would have to be completed, most of those or some of those have bonding on them, which ensures that if you don't finish, they can go to the bonding company, hire somebody to finish what you didn't, and pay them out of that bond. I see. It's like an insurance policy. So you, you have to pay up front the bond, or do you get an insurance company to bond for you? It, it's like an insurance policy. You, I see. And some of them, uh, some, some, some proposals, you can do it either <laughs> way. They will let you just, you know, whether it's a $150,000 bond, whether it's a $150,000 bond, whether it's a $500,000 bond, you either have to have a bonding company put up that bond, which means you have basically bought an insurance policy from them, or you put up that amount of money into a separate account that uh, only the government can access after it's in there. And if you complete the project uh, the way it's supposed to be done, if you put up a cash bond, they give you money back to you at the end of the day. And the cash bond covers un, undone work, uncompleted work? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, so the government really is is uh, trying to protect itself from, from having individuals take advantage of them. The, the government is the government. Um, they, they will... They do their best to make sure they hire the best person and the best company at the time. Uh, doesn't always work out that way. Understand, understand. We, we only have uh, a few minutes. Um, let, let's suppose that we have a number of people that are wanting to start some kind of business, uh, either tree trimming or construction or lawn What's some advice you can give to them? Well, uh, first advice is uh, the Small Business Administration has a lot of information. Uh, this Endeavor Center with OSU and you all has a lot of information. Uh, the government, sam.gov, uh, has a lot of information. You have to, to find out what you have what you want to sell, produce, or a service you want to provide, and try to find who buys that in the government. Once you know who buys that in the government, you can find out what processes you have to go through to be able to sell that to them. 
every agency and that all start with a SAM registration. Uh, they all start uh, with uh, the SAM.gov site is where they put out most of their proposals. Uh, there's also a GSA site, which unless you get really deep into it, most people don't want to go to. But that's where I'd start. The, the SBA and the local local small business authorities that you have in your community. And the, the small business development centers, you know, which, which yes. uh, uh, are not only in in uh, Ohio, but they're all they're in every you know, state. In every, in state. every state, right, right. Every state has one, and and most of them are connected with a state university uh, that that helps facilitate that and they have excellent people working there uh, that are either former business people or trained people that can answer most of your questions so that's that's a, the place where you'd want to start at is with your business center of education portals locally and then with the government uh, Scott it's really been a pleasure not only in, in working with you um, I, I, I have seen where you, your your wisdom in running a business um, has throughout your business helped you to grow. And when I say wisdom, it's not a matter of of just reading a book. And you, you know, you will actually acquire that from doing. I've uh, long long hard nights and help from people like you help from uh, the SBA and, and other things. Uh, if you want to be in business, you got to know business. There's no no end to it. Well, again, th thank you for your uh, uh, helping me to understand about government contracting. Uh, this is Pat Dangle and yes, with sir. Scott Swain. Uh, he owns TCS uh, Forestry Management. Uh, thank you for watching and viewing.